Let's begin reading in verse 5, or I'll read and you follow with me. Paul says, servants or slaves, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, or respect and trembling, and singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing that a man does, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be a bond or free. That's a slave or a free man. Then he says in verse 9 to the masters, and ye masters, do the same thing unto them, forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. Now, as we go through Ephesians on Wednesday night, we've discovered how we walk in harmony in the home. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit, and that the result will have submissive wives, will have loving husbands, and will have obedient children who submit to their parents and parents who will not provoke their children to wrath, but will bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So you might say for the last several sections of Ephesians, we've been dealing with harmony in the home. Well, tonight we move into harmony in the workplace. And we need to bring the Christian ethic all the way into the workplace. It's interesting that Ephesians starts in chapter 1 in the heavenlies. It ends in chapter 6 in the home and in the workplace. So the book of Ephesians is very, very practical, and the blessings that we have in Christ in the heavenlies are meant to be lived out in our daily lives as we walk in this world. Now, he's speaking to servants and masters. He, verse 5, mentions them. The word servants there is actually a better translation, would be slaves, and that that, that it's a reference to the doulos, the bond slaves, But it's probably a mixture both of slaves who voluntarily chose to serve their master and then those who were also bought or purchased. And I'll talk more about slavery in just a moment. But we're going to give it the application of employees, verses 5 to 8, and employers, verse 9. So as a general rule, you're you're either an employee or you're an employer. You might be self-employed and working just yourself. But either way, the Christian worth ethic is clearly taught in this passage. But in the time Paul was writing in the Roman world, there were 16 million slaves in the Roman Empire. One, or th- one out of all every three individuals in Rome were actually a slave. There were more slaves in Rome and in the Roman Empire than there were free men. So it was a, it was a common institution. It was something that was common and part of the economy of that day. And it was something that has been around since mankind. You go all the way back even to the book of Genesis and into Exodus where the people of Israel became slaves in Egypt and God had to deliver them from that slavery, that 430 years of bondage to Pharaoh and to Egypt. So slavery was a very commonplace thing. And in the early years of Christianity, Christianity was an illegal religion in the Roman Empire, but yet its preaching and its teaching and the Word of, work of the gospel and the spirit changing lives from the inside out would change the institution of slavery. I, I, I believe that the abolition of slavery uh, today or slaves was the result of the Christian influence in the world of understanding that all men are created equal by God. And in England, William Wilberforce and America, of course, Abraham Lincoln and the issues that we have there and that history in America today is being distorted. And it's uh, interesting to realize that Christianity brought women up to her right place, brought children up to the right place. And eventually, even though the Bible doesn't overtly condemn slavery, it doesn't commend slavery either. And so it worked from the inside out to change men's hearts, men's attitudes, and eventually the institution of slavery that was a part of the culture And there were so many slaves that if they would have just openly, radically opposed slavery, it would have brought the church into conflict with the Roman government even more so than preaching the gospel. And a lot of slaves would have actually been out of employment or out of work, but they would also have been given over to poverty and in the worst way. So God slowly, gradually changed the heart of man through the gospel. 
and then slavery limited. But sadly today, because of man's sinful heart, there is still slavery going on in different fashions in the world even today. So Paul's words to slaves and masters is the last of three examples of submission. Go back with me to chapter 5 and verse 21, where Paul says that we should be submitting ourselves one to another in the fear or reverence of God. And I pointed out that that was a lead-in to marriage or the home, and that it's not just the wife's submission to her husband or the children to their parents, but it's a submission of one another in the respect or reverence or fear of God. So we had wives, we had children, and we had servants. And the whole focus of the passage is on those who had to submit, and then also the balance of those who were over them and had to give them the love, had to give them the discipline and the training and not provoke them to wrath. And then the masters who had to give that which is just and equal unto their servants. It's interesting that Jesus, as I said, elevated women. And I would refer you to John 4 and John 8. He stopped and talked to the woman of Samaria at the well. And no Jewish man in public would ever stop and talk to a woman, but Jesus did. And she was a woman of Samaria of another race and another religion. And then Jesus also elevated children. He said, suffer the children to come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. And then Jesus also elevates manual labor. He was a carpenter and probably a good carpenter. Can you imagine going to Jesus to have him build a cabinet for you? Or maybe Jesus, can you build me a pulpit? And I'm sure that Jesus had blisters on his hands. Now, in the Greco-Roman world, especially among the Greeks, and even the Romans, manual labor was despised. And those who did manual labor were despised. And so it's the influence of Christianity again that elevated the place of manual labor and hard work. And here we have God coming from heaven, and he's the son of God who comes as a servant or a slave, I remind you. And he gave himself for others to serve them, But Jesus also was in submission to his parents for those 33 or 30 years before he went into public ministry. And no doubt he worked with his dad when he was young, trained as a carpenter. And uh, what an interesting thing that is that Jesus and Christianity elevates manual labor. So it's so important. Now, before we begin to unpack these verses, and we won't be long tonight, just five verses, and we're going to move through it quickly. I want to say just a little bit about the subject of slavery. There are those who say that Paul should have openly and clearly condemned slavery, but he did not, and so he's sometimes attacked for that. Let me say a couple of things. Number one, Paul did not condemn slavery in this passage, but neither did he condone it. I hear people saying all the time, well, the Bible condones slavery. No, it doesn't condone slavery. It doesn't, it doesn't promote it, doesn't encourage it, doesn't condone it. And there's nothing in this passage that affirms slavery as a natural or valid or divinely mandated institution. Now, I want you to think for just a moment. We've just had wives and husbands. This is what we call marriage. And Jesus said, For this cause a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. And he's quoting from the book of Genesis from the very beginning. So that is a God-ordained, God-designed institution. I just had the privilege of officiating a, a wedding for a pastor friend of mine last Saturday, and I was asked to do a little message on weddings. And we br- we, I brought up the Genesis passage that this is the leaving and the cleaving and the one flesh is the foundation for the marriage relationship. So marriage has that Old Testament endorsement and teaching and God-ordained institution, but slavery does not. And then we have children in this home and children who are obedient and submissive to their parents and parents who are training and loving and nurturing their children. So you have marriage and the family and the home, which is a God-ordained institution. Now, Paul Paul's discussion, secondly, of the duties of Christian slaves and the responsibilities of Christian masters transformed the institution 
of slavery, which is not a divine, God-given institution. And by the way, lest I forget, many of the slaves that were in the Greco-Roman world were more highly educated and more cultured than even their masters. Some have a theory that Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, was actually a slave and that he was actually freed by his master and that he was a slave at one time and he was a doctor or a physician. So they were actually highly trained, highly educated, and in many cases in the Greco-Roman world love, but there was also the cruel aspects that they were property, they could be sold, they could be traded, they had no rights. But again, Christianity changed men's hearts to understand that we're created equal. I think it's interesting that if you do believe in evolution, and then we're the product of just random development over billions of years, then that certainly would be a foundation for not only racism, but also for slavery, that we have superior races of that nature because we're all the product of evolution. We've evolved farther. But if you believe that we're created in the image and likeness of God, by God, that we're unique and that God has created us all equal. And by the way, all humanity goes back to two individuals, a guy named Adam and a guy named Eve. And that may sound oversimplistic, but I believe it's true. All humanity goes back to two individuals. So we're all united in that sense of coming from that common stock of Adam and Eve. And then I would make reference to the book of uh, Philemon. Philemon was a master, a slave owner, and he had a slave named Onesimus. And Paul was writing to Philemon, that little postcard epistle, which is one short chapter. And he was saying to Philemon, I know that Onesimus robbed you and fled from you, but he's become a Christian. He met Paul in Rome, and so Paul is sending him back to Philemon, who Paul happened to know. He was one of Paul's converts, and he says, I know he's wronged you. If he has, I'll pay you back, and I want you to receive him, listen carefully, as a brother, not as a slave, but as a brother. And think about when they gathered in their church at that time, they were masters and slaves. And when they took communion, they were masters and slaves worshiping together. The Bible is actually telling us that all the ground at the foot of the cross is level. In the church, there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. There's neither Greek nor Gentile or Jew. But we're all one in Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting that it was this transformation that came from viewing all persons made in God's image that ultimately destroyed the institution of slavery. Now, we can't spend the whole night on this subject. And I know that, there, again, there are critics of the Bible that blast the Bible as teaching slavery. But I think that they are missing a very important point that slavery was eventually uh, abolished by the Christian influence, by the preaching of the gospel, and by the understanding that we're created all in the image of God. Now, there's two sections we're going to look at tonight. The first is in verses 5 to 8, and that is simply God's word to slaves. In our case, it would be employees. Don't, let's go back to verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will, doing services to the Lord, not as unto men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be a bond or free. Now, I want to point out that the primary responsibility of the slave to his master is obedience. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. I think these points will appear on the screen as well in verse 5. Servants or slaves, be obedient to them that are your masters. So you have wives, submit to your husbands, children, obey your parents, slaves, be obedient unto your masters. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, servants be subject to your masters. Now it's the same word Paul used to describe the responsibility of children to their parents in verse 1, when he said, children, obey your parents. It's the same word, servants, obey your 
masters. So that's the primary command that God gives to these servants, that they are to be obedient unto their masters. It's so important. Now, the question must be asked, how should they obey? Grudgingly, angrily, stubbornly? Should they just revolt against their masters? No, let's break it down. They should, number one, le- number one obey, and I'm going to give you four ways they need to obey from the text, respectively, with respect. Notice it says you do it with fear and trembling. So be obedient to your masters according to the flesh. That basically means your earthly masters. So you have a master in heaven, but he's talking about our, our masters on earth. Now again, the application for us today isn't the, the slave and master relationship, but it would be the employee and employer relationship. So basically saying when you go to your job, your place of employment, be obedient to your employer and do what they tell you to do, as long as it's not uh, illegal or immoral or violating biblical principles. You're there on the job. You're supposed to be obedient. Now notice their earthly masters, they that are after the flesh or according to the flesh. But there's that statement that I was pointing out in verse 1, fear and trembling. Now, that means it's not a begrudging respect or servile respect, shaking in your boots, or in this case, your sandals, lest you make a wrong move. But it's the same word used for the fear or reverence of God. Back in chapter 5, verse 21, that we should have a submission one to another in the fear of the Lord. That's the same kind of root word as the word respect. And so it means to respect the authority that is placed over you. Now again, we have the marriage relationship, we have the parent-child relationship, and where do people learn respect of authority? Where do they learn to respect those who have been placed over him? In the home. One of the reasons why we have so much chaos and rebellion and confusion in our culture today is because of the break down of the home. I'm always kind of, I hate to say this, but kind of pulling out my hair, spiritual hair, even though it looks like I have lots of hair, I'm pulling it out. When I watch the news and I see these politicians interviewed and they're trying to heal all the ills of our society, but they've rejected God, rejected the Bible, rejected Christianity, rejected Christian morals and their influences, and our Supreme Court has messed up marriage and all that's going on in our culture today. And I'm thinking, how can you not see this? As goes the home, goes go, so goes society. The breakdown in the home directly relates to the increase in crime, the lack of respect, lack of respect of authority, the breakdown in all the levels of culture goes back to the home because it's the foundation of society. So the children learn to obey and respect their parents in the home. Thus, they learn as they pass into adulthood to respect their employers or the employee as they go to the job. Now, it's hard sometimes when they're not respectful and you say, my boss is really a bummer and he's harsh and he's hard and he makes me work a lot and I don't really care for my boss, but you still have to do this obedient respect as the Bible tells us to. So again, you're going to need Ephesians 5, 18, just as husbands and wives do. We must be filled with the Spirit. Amen? We must have the Spirit's filling to be able to be obediently, respectfully serving those who we are employed by. Then notice, secondly, that they should obey sincerely. Look at verse 5 in that little phrase, in singleness of your heart. In singleness of your heart. And then catch the phrase, we'll look at it in just a second, as unto Christ. So they do it with respect, fear and trembling, They do it in singleness of heart. Now, my King James Bible has singleness of heart. The NIV translates that sincerity. It's an interesting word. It comes from two Latin words, which literally mean without wax or without wax. Sincere. 
You find that reference in the Bible to being sincere. It's the opposite of hypocrisy and duplicity. But, but why, why the concept of without wax? Well, in the ancient world, they didn't have the glass that we have, and they didn't have uh, the, the plastics that we have. So it was more common to use pottery, and they were also into sculptures, and they used clay and pots. So whenever a clay pot would crack or whenever a clay pot would break, they would actually take the powder from the clay dust, they would mix it with wax, they would make a compound of the clay and the wax, they would mix it together, and they would fill in the cracks or the faults in their pottery with this wax mixed with this clay, and it would become kind of a, a putty that they would use to fill in the flaws. So what it means is, is that you have no flaws, that you are consistent, you're honest, you're sincere, you're without wax. It all also carried the idea of to examine by sunlight. And if you were buying a pot in a market, you would go out where it was sunny and bright, you would hold it up to the light and make sure it had no cracks in the pot. So your life needs to be able to be examined it has no duplicity or no hypocrisy. It has to have sincerity. So Christians on the job are not to be hypocritical. They're supposed to be sincere. They're not to have a divided heart. Or We would also use the idea of two-faced, but be devoted to their job as unto the Lord. And then thirdly, we are to do our job consistently. Consistently. Notice verse 6 not with eye service as men pleasers. Now that phrase, eye service, men pleasers, this is something you can relate to. It means you're not just working when your boss is watching. Remember back when you were in elementary school and maybe I'm just, you know, kind of dating myself or giving things away we used to do. And I, 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 I wasn't one of the rebels, but I used to freak out when the teacher ever would leave the room. Remember when the teacher would leave the room? Why are you laughing? And everyone would lose their minds and jump up and run around and climb up on their desk and throw spit wads and throw papers and freak out. And then they would always get somebody to watch the door. She's coming, he's coming, you know, get back to your desk. And people would freak out. I used to think, gee, and you know, today they'd have cameras and they bust you. But back then, if the teacher left the room, everyone just freaked out. Or maybe you were in a gym class. I remember back then it was called junior high. Today it's called middle school. But you go from sixth grade to seventh grade, and you have to have PE, and you have to run and do exercise. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not into running, by the way. I don't do jogging. Whenever I see somebody jogging, I think, why? We have cars. Why would you do that? If I hear the word exercise, I sit down until the thought goes away. <laughs> so here I am, and we had to run the mile, run the mile. I haven't ever run two feet. Why should I run a mile? And we used to run on the track, and if the coach would actually go into the gym or go somewhere, we'd duck into a bush, and we'd wait, and we'd you know, look at the watch, and then we'd run back out, or I'd hide in the bushes till the crowd came around, and then I'd jump in the front like I was winning the race, you know, and all the things you do. And I remember I had a job one time when the boss actually hid in the rafters and was spying on us. Everybody knew that he was watching, so we're all working really good, you know. And there's an old English proverb that says, when the cat's away, the mice will play. So that's what he's saying. You don't just work. Oh, the boss is watching. The boss, get to work, get to work. The boss is watching. So you're conscientious. You're consistent and conscientious in your... You're doing it as unto the Lord. You're not doing it as unto men. You're not just being a man pleaser. It's so very important. John Phillips in his commentary said, the Christian employee is to be diligent. He's not to, to call in sick when he's healthy. He's not to waste his boss's time in idle conversation or conduct person, conduct personal business when he should be working. He's not to drag his feet, paid breaks, times, arrive late, leave early, or demand that two people do a job that he could do alone. Those are the world's ways, not the Christian way. So we're to be conscientiously 
working in obedience and consistently working as unto the Lord. Notice it says in verse 6, you're doing the will of God and you're doing it from the heart. So again, you're, do, you're doing it as unto the Lord, you're in the will of God, and you're doing it in, from the heart. So my fourth point on how we must obey on the job or the slave to his master or the employee to the employer is in verse 7 that we need to do it enthusiastically or wholeheartedly. In the King James translation, it has with good will, with good will doing service. Again, here it is, as to the Lord and not to men. But the idea is that we do it wholeheartedly. The New English Bible translates that cheerfully. And that's, again, quite difficult to do. To go to your job and do your job and to do it cheerfully as unto the Lord. When I was a young Christian, I had a lot of manual labor jobs. I worked for an organization called Manpower. It was a day labor thing. And you'd go down to the main office and your calls would come in. We need helpers or workers. And you'd get sent out on all these really low-down, dirty, horrible, rotten jobs that no one wanted. But it was the only thing available. And I did it. And I, I mean, I, I had some pretty nasty jobs. There was only one job that I did that one day and said, I won't be back tomorrow. <laughs> but just to praying and the Lord help me, give me the right attitude, let me do it as unto you. Let me not complain, let me not gripe, let me do what I'm told. And to let, let, let me be a witness as unto you, Lord. Now I want you to notice three times. In verse 5, as unto Christ. In verse 6, as the servants of Christ. And then in verse 7, as to the Lord. Jesus makes the difference. Amen? He can turn drudgery into joy. He can turn a terrible, dirty, rotten job into a blessing if you do it as unto the Lord. You're doing it as you are doing it as unto the Lord. It's like any job. You don't do it as unto man, it says in verse 7, but you're doing it as unto the Lord. So if you're cleaning houses, it's the Lord's house. If you're cooking a meal, you're cooking it for Jesus. If you're an Uber driver, your passenger is Jesus and you're doing it unto Him. And you're treating others with that respect and you're doing it as unto the Lord. Again, how Christianity can change the workforce and the employer and employee relationship and the whole attitude on the job. Because you're no longer serving men, but you're doing it as unto the Lord. Now this is a very, very important point to carry over in Christian service. Sometimes people want to serve in church, but they don't have a servant's heart and realize they're doing it as unto the Lord and not unto men. So when the appreciation doesn't come, they don't get pats on the back, or people aren't really nice, or they're rude, or they don't get the recognition, they get upset, frustrated, they quit, and they leave church. And the, most of the time it's because they weren't doing it as unto the Lord. So the thing is, it's not the need in front of you. It's the call behind you. And it's the Lord beyond you. You're not doing it as unto people. You're doing it as unto the Lord. Whenever, as a pastor, I start focusing on people too much, I start griping and complaining. Because people are fickle. People can be flaky. I just thought I would encourage you tonight. <laughs> and you need to get your eyes off the people and get them on the Lord. The same thing in your marriage. Same thing with serving around the house. Maybe in your domestic duties. No one appreciates me. Well, you're doing it to the Lord. We're going to see that's from the Lord in verse 8. We get our reward. So if your boss doesn't appreciate you, your husband doesn't appreciate you, your wife doesn't appreciate you, it's unto the Lord that you're doing it. So if you can just get this attitude that I'm a servant of Christ, it doesn't matter if you're driving a truck or swinging a hammer, it doesn't matter if you're working a desk on a computer, whatever your job might be, you might be a plumber, electrician, maybe a lawyer, maybe a, a used car salesman, we'll pray for you after the service. 
there are such a thing as Christian used car salesmen. You're doing it as unto the Lord. You're selling this car to Jesus. You're fixing this plumbing leak for Jesus. You're driving your truck for the glory of God. You're doing it as unto Jesus. So everything we do, we do as unto Christ, as the servants of Christ, and as unto the Lord. Jesus is the one that makes the difference. Now, why should we obey respectfully, sincerely, conscientiously, and enthusiastically? Here it is, verse 8. Knowing that, we know something. That whatsoever good thing any man's done, he or she, they shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or whether he be free, whether he be the slave or whether he be the master, whether he be the employee or the employer. If we've done these things that Paul describes, if we serve with respect, obey with respect, and sincerely, conscientiously, enthusiastically, and we do it as unto the Lord, then we will, verse 8, be blessed by and rewarded by God. This is the steps that we take to be blessed by God, not only now in this world, but also when we die and we go to heaven, we'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now, that's not just for pastors. That's not just for evangelists. That's for faithful mothers, faithful fathers, faithful truck drivers, faithful workers, construction workers, whoever you are, whatever God called you to do, you are God's servant. You're not working for that company. You're not working for man. You're working as unto the Lord. And from the Lord, verse 8, you will receive your reward. So you keep that perspective that it's not a payday at the end of the week, but it's at the end of your life when you're rewarded by the Lord. Now he closes with one verse in verse 9 to the Christian masters, or we would say Christian employers. He says, and ye masters do the same thing unto them. That's an interesting statement. He's basically saying all that I just described for the servants toward the masters, now I want the masters to do toward the servant. Remember when he said, wives, submit to your husbands? He said, husbands, love your wives. Remember when he said, children, obey your parents? He said, parents, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition to the Lord. Remember now he says, servants, obey your masters? And he says, masters, do the same to your servants. Give them what is just, right, and equal. This is why Christianity changed the world, certainly changed this evil, wicked institution of slavery. So the husbands and parents, Paul describes as master's corresponding duty as well. It's dealt with more briefly. You say, well, why is there only one verse for the master, but there's four verses for the slave? And it's probably because the central theme and writing of the text is focused on the submission. It goes back to chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another in the fear of God. So that's the focus, it's submission. So he has a larger section for the slaves, and the slaves were more common than the masters in the ancient world. But Paul says to the masters, or in our case, employers, is truly revolutionary. First of all, number one, Paul states what we call the managerial golden rule in verse 9. This is the principle. Do the same thing unto them. In other words, if you want respect, show them respect. If you want sincerity, then be sincere. If you want them to be conscientious, then you should be the same. If you want them to be pleasant, then you should be pleasant. So you can't mistreat your employees and expect them not to show the same to the customers that come into the store. We all know that if we have been around for a while, that customer service in our world today isn't what it used to be. I've gone into Lowe's to buy something and didn't know if anyone was even in the entire store for a whole hour. Find one guy hiding under a trash can somewhere. Hey, can I buy something? Oh yeah, I guess so. 
Remember when people used to pump gas for you and clean your windshield and check your oil? Unbelievable. Just that thought today just blows our mind. Our people would say, can I help you? And they would answer questions. And today you have to go find somebody to help you. And then they're like disgusted that you would bother them. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And when you find somebody that's helpful and goes out of their way, you think, this guy must be born again. He must be a Christian. I can feel, feel the vibe coming from him right now. Actually, when I go to Lowe's or Home Depot and everybody I run into is, hi, Pastor John, hi, Pastor John. I think it's called uh, Home Depot Revival Christian Fellowship. <laughs> but what a witness we can be to the world around us when we serve the way Peter described here in this passage. And again, this would apply to Christian service also in the church. So, do the same as unto them. And then secondly, we have the prohibition for the masters in verse 9. It says there, forbearing threatenings. So he must not threaten. So he must practice the managerial golden rule, and then he must not threaten. That's a prohibition, forbearing threatenings. The slaves could be uh, beaten. They could be tortured. They could be put to death. And the masters could be cruel, so he's telling them not to do that. And then thirdly, verse 9, he must remember, and I love this closing point, he must remember that as a master, that he has a master in heaven, just as the slave has a master in heaven, who will one day judge him, that you're going to be answering to God. So in verse 9, you have a principle. The principle is do the same as unto them. The prohibition in verse 9, forbearing threatenings, and then an incentive in verse 9 that he must do the same or that you have a master in heaven and he will judge you. Notice in verse 9, forbearing threatenings knowing that your master, and it's referring to not only the, the slave owner or the employers, but it's referring to the slaves as well, that he's, he's both your masters, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there, I love this, respect of persons with him. When you get to heaven, you can't say, well, I was the owner of the company, or I was the slave owner, I was the master, and that's not the way it's going to work. God's not going to take note of that. Someone said, the gold ring of the master does not attract his eye, and it is not averted from the iron fetters of the slave. I love that. Again, the ground is equal at the foot of the cross. And we realize that we both have a master in heaven and that we're going to give an account to him and we're going to be judged by him. And remember Jesus said, if you would be the greatest in this world, become what? The servant of all. So in God's kingdom, the economy of God, the greatness is being humble and serving others for the glory of God. Amen? Let's pray.